Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this uh, beautiful summer day. We're going to start with the executive director's report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I have some scheduling updates. Um, first, for next week, we um, will not have a board meeting. And also, the week after that, we will not have a board meeting. So it's May 16th and May 23rd. Our board meetings are, are canceled. Um, on May 30th, we are planning to have a legislative update. And I say planning because I am very hopeful that the legislature will have adjourned by then. Um, but even if they're not, we could still have a legislative update. And we'll also update you on the, our budget as well. Um, and then I do want to announce that on June 6th, uh, we are putting together a panel discussion on uh, Vermont healthcare workforce. We've invited folks from the administration, from the hospitals, from the FQHCs, and I don't want to leave every, anyone out, but a wide variety of healthcare workforce providers. So that should be very interesting. And just a reminder for folks just to sign in if, if uh, on the way in up front. That's it. Thank you, Susan. The next item on the agenda are the minutes of uh -huh. May 2nd. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the, the minutes of Wednesday, May 2nd, without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. So at this point, we'll invite uh, Michael and Emily to come forward. <laughs> He's walking, Michael. <laughs> Don't stop. That's good. Come on. I'm the director of the Health Information Exchange Program at DEVA. And Michael Costa, Deputy Commissioner at DEVA. Um, we're here to provide an update. H901, which is new proposed legislation, calls for an update and a work plan to be delivered to you all, as well as um, identified committee members uh, on May 1st. So we delivered that, uh, which I believe you all have. So I think we've worked out with your staff that we're going to change our bi-monthly cadence, which we had <coughs> established. Um, to provide you with updates to align with H901. So that's what this is, a continuation of that conversation. Great. Okay. Let's work. All right. So um, on the list of discussion topics today, um, we wanted to go over the details of H901 and ensure that everybody understands each of the facets of that bill, um, which if I had to summarize is basically continued monitoring and oversight of the Health Information Exchange Health IT work uh, that began a decade ago, but um, really this continues the evaluation work that began in 2017. We're also going to review our progress. There's since the evaluation report was released, we have been here once, but we wanted to ensure that you were aware of, sorry, am I too far from you? Yeah, okay. why don't you move it a little closer? Yeah. Thank you. It's so intimidating to have a new face. <laughs> <laughs> so for the second point here, we wanted to review our progress since the release of the evaluation report, which came out in November of 2017, and just ensure that you all were aware of the work that happened between November and um, when we delivered the work plan to you in May. Um, we're going to go over the details of the work plan, leaving some of those details for Vital to present because they will discuss how they will actually be uh, addressing recommendations related to the operations of the HIE or the BHI. Um, and then the contingency planning is part of H901, so we wanted to provide an update on that as well. So just as background, so we're all just kind of thinking from the same frame of reference. Um, in 2017, Act 73 called for an evaluation of health information exchange in Vermont with a real specific look at the operator of the HIE vital. Um, and the study report demonstrated a few things, which Don Gallagher spoke to you all about in um, January. 
Um, so they noted that HIV is expensive and difficult for all states. Also that Vermont stakeholders affirm that HIE systems are essential. They're essential to providing quality care and to measuring our healthcare system to further health reform efforts. Um, they noted that Vermont is not organized in, in a way to increase its chances of success. And there we had a long conversation about our governance structure and the many oversight bodies that at that time were not seemingly coordinated. They noted that Vermont's HIE has yet to set a solid foundation and stakeholders lack confidence, and that there is clear room for improvement and Vermont can reproduce other states' successes. So as you may remember, they provided a list of recommendations um, of which have translated to the work plan that we're going to go over with you. Um, they were not time bound in terms of the recommendations that they, they provided, but they were sort of dimensional. Um, and so we'll go over how uh, we've translated those into tactical activities, assigned an accountable party, and um, created a timeline for execution. So one of the gratifying parts of this project is that there are many legislative studies, and sometimes those studies uh, exist and people don't take action on them. I'm really pleased that the investment we've made in the HTS study uh, has paid off. And a lot of H901 is merely taking the recommendations in that study and trying to bring them to life. Uh, we think it was the right work at the right time and now we're engaged in our partnership with Vital to see whether both parties can make real progress to those goals. Uh, if the four major questions in HIE are what does the state want, can Vital credibly deliver it, uh, are providers better off and are Vermonters better off? It's a really a focus on the first two things. What do we want and can Vital deliver it? And so what you see here are the elements of H901, which is just making those HDS recommendations real and then adding in a few substantive components uh, that we think are prompted by HDS's report. So Emily, if you want to walk through the individual elements, I think that'd be helpful. For sure. So the first, of course, is this work plan, um, which we delivered in May 1st. And so that's to provide you all, as well as the legislature, um, with a clear path for evaluating our success or failure and implementing the recommendations from the report. Um, it also calls for progress updates to be delivered bi-monthly, and that's, um, as I'm interpreting it, progress towards implementation of what has become the work plan, so the exact activities we will execute um, to address those recommendations. H901 also called for a contingency plan, and this contingency plan would be triggered if DIVA and VITAL cannot implement the recommendations from the evaluation report, and that's to be delivered on September 1st. They asked for Health Tech to come back and continue their evaluation as a third party entity to look at our progress, and they'll be providing you all with a report and recommendation um, on their observations on October, by October 15th. They called out um, the need to deliver a health information technology plan, or what we're calling a health information exchange plan. They're syn synonymous by November 1st, and our steering committee is working on that now. Um, they also asked for two reports by January 15th. First, a recommendation on Vermont's consent policy, which we've talked about um, in this venue, as well as a recommendation on how to improve interoperability and the utility of EHRs. And um, just based on legislative conversation, I think that's specifically around the use of a sort of a centralized EHR and how um, we can better utilize technology to support at the point of care. Just to make one quick and obvious point, we, H901 is not passed, as both houses have been sent to the governor, we, we are behaving as if the present version of H901 will eventually become law, and so we've complied with the May 1st deadlines, even though that hasn't taken effect yet. Uh, of course, in the legislative session, it's not over till it's over, and so whatever comes out of the legislature and is signed by the governor will, will abide by. Uh, on the consent <laughs> policy, uh, we expect that to be an open and transparent discussion among stakeholders. I think once the legislative session is over, Dee will be in consultation with you and with other stakeholders about how to organize that. Uh, and that'll be something where myself and Dee, the general counsel, will probably take the lead in trying to structure that conversation. Are there any questions about the components of H901 before we move on? Okay. 
you. So as I mentioned, we wanted to make sure to update you on progress <coughs> made and from the time that the evaluation report was submitted to you um, to today, um, or when the, the first work plan was submitted. Um, so as you may remember from when Don Gallagher from HDS was here, one of the significant issues that they pointed out was a lack of clear governance and a lack of strategic plan driving this work. So in November, we convened the HIE Steering Committee. It's a small group of dedicated people who represent different facets of the healthcare system who are fully focused on developing consensus-driven strategic plan. And that's the plan that will be provided to you no later than November 1st for review and approval. Um, so during this time, we've done a considerable amount of work with this group. They meet uh, twice a month for four hours, four hours total. Um, and during that time, uh, they've set their guiding principles, they've framed out um, what the HIE plan will cover, and they've developed use cases or um, sort of business needs um, for HIE. So now their work is to translate those needs into objectives and goals that are achievable uh, for the period going forward, and we'll update that plan in. And in about the November timeframe, we also established the HIT Advisory Committee. And that's Michael and I working with the VITAL board chair, a couple of select members from VITAL's board, as well as their executive team. And we got quickly to work, meeting once a week, um, to develop a plan to support VITAL specifically through this transitionary period. And you'll see in your work plan in the appendix, the short-term goals of that plan, are, or the short-term plan is included as an appendix to the work plan. Um, so we, we got together um, that work, that work plan guided our work, um, and we continue to meet every other week to ensure that you know communication is solid, that we're supporting uh, them during this transition, and that we're being good partners. Um, we noted that last time we were here, we also sort of changed the uh, contracting vehicle with VITAL. So in the past, they were primarily funded by a grant that supported their core services, as well as a smaller contract uh, that allowed them to do development work. We've since changed those contracts to be deliverable-based uh, contracts. There's two of them. Uh, there are stated goals in each of the contracts, uh, and they're to uh, report on progress in a formalized way on each of those goals um, at a regular cadence. So we had already made that adjustment. We've extended uh, VITALS contracts uh, from this fiscal year through the first six months of the next fiscal year and further refined um, how VITAL is going to address the recommendations that they uh, they sort of create that solid foundation or approve upon the core functions of the HIE. Um, and we've created incentives, financial incentives, in that contract for HDS's recommendation. I think in all these steps, we're trying really hard to give VITAL two things. We're trying to create clarity and accountability in HIE. And so we're trying to make it very clear what the state wants from VITAL and create a framework where we can hold them accountable for delivering it. Uh, I appreciate the effort VITAL and its team has made over the past months to reorganize our contract in that way and to extend our contract. So we're both very clear about what we want and we have a framework for holding folks accountable when, you know, if, if they don't deliver it. So far, that has been, I think, a real improvement in the relationship between DIVA and VITAL, and we'd like to structure ongoing contracts, feature contracts, and the HAE work plan in the same way, uh, where we give people the creativity they need to succeed, uh, but we also hold folks accountable for the results of their work. And just to underscore Michael's important point, so we transitioned from a period of time where VITAL was expecting um, sort of a core, you know, sorry, for lack of a better phrase, bucket of money to support their work going forward to um, a really formalized structure where we're having a real conversation about the goals that we want to achieve, what deliverables were, will be to support the achievement of those goals, and how we're all going to work together to move forward. And just one additional point. It's not about holding Vital accountable alone. It's also about holding Diva accountable. Uh, I've been very demanding of our own team to say, if we want something from VITAL, you need to have something like a driver diagram that says, this is what you're going for, and this is why you're trying to reach that goal, and this is why we think it will work. And I think it's just been a good process of trying to demand more of ourselves if we're going to continue to spend and invest taxpayer money in VITAL. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
So moving on to the work plan. So just a couple of notes to orient to the work plan, and I believe, do you all have it? I'm gonna walk through it, I just wanna make sure. We do have, just have the slides. It starts with a memo and it looks, uh -huh. yeah, you got it, okay. And, and I want to apologize. When you have a lawyer draft an HAE work plan, you get a work plan that starts with a memorandum. Um, so I, I will take responsibility for that. Okay, so to orient you to the structure of the work plan. So first, it's really important to note, as Michael was saying, um, that we developed this work plan in partnership. So that HIT advisory committee was our uh, mechanism to work together um, and really set forth the goals and objectives that we wanted to achieve together uh, to further the HIE landscape. Uh, the HIE Steering Committee uh, and the Vital Board have reviewed the plan. Uh, we've incorporated their comments before sending it on to you. And the work plan um, is structured. It's a pretty basic structure. So it starts out with our overarching goals, and those are taken um, as, you know, sort of extracted from the HDS evaluation report. Um, we've linked objectives which, with each of those goals, so you know what we're working towards to achieve the goal. Each activity is intended to drive achievement, and we've assigned accountability and timing to each activity. So you know who the actual accountable party is, who the stakeholders involved are, and who, when the time frame is that we're going to actually execute on the achievement of that activity. So to move on to the elements of the plan. So the first two, and what you see listed here are the goals, the overarching goals of the plan. So the first two are to implement an effective HIE governance model and develop and manage to a strong HIE plan. So these are fundamentally addressed by the development of the HIE steering committee and their development of the HIE plan. So I won't spend too much time on this, but please let me know if you have questions. Um, I think just one quick note on this is that we expect that the HAE steering committee, of which we're a part, will come up with a governance model and include that as a recommendation within the HIE plan. So they're a small dedicated group now. We expect that that group will grow and we'll have subcommittees that will address certain dimensions. We'll have an executive body. We'll have a really formalized way to oversee execution of this work going forward. So now they're in the strategic planning phase and going forward they'll be in the, the oversight and, and strategy development phase. The second set of goals here are ensure that VHI, the HIE operated by VITAL, is well governed and compliant with federal and state regulations. Ensure the VHI operator is focused and delivers upon its core mission and making the VHI operations accountable to all customers, including the state. And those are the real crux of the work plan of how we're getting to what does the state want and can our vendors deliver. So we'll go through that in more detail. And finally, this last goal here, demonstrate progress in implementing the recommendations from the Act 73 evaluation report and plan for contingencies. Those are really the, 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 the um, sort of the mandates from H901. Um, so all of the things that we've listed there are listed as activities within the work plan. Okay, so I should have said, so I'm not gonna go over in too much detail those first two goals or the last one, but I'll focus on those middle three. Okay, so starting with the first one there in that section, ensure the VHI is well governed and compliant with federal and state regulations and let me orient you to where we are. So this is starting on page five of the work plan if you have it. And if not, I'm gonna go over it. Um, so you'll see on the left-hand side that there's our objectives, and then if you move, if you read from left to right, you've got the associated activities, who's accountable, start and end dates, and the status, and so we'll provide you with the continued status uh, every time we're here every other month. So in order to achieve this goal, we've set the following objectives, establish an HIT advisory group to support short-term short, short needs, um, and again, the work plan that we established with that group is included as an appendix to this document. Appropriately staff the VHI operator, which I'll let Vital speak to at greater length, but you all know that they've, um, that Mike Smith has come on board and they've made some other staffing decisions um, to ensure <coughs> efficiencies of the operation. 
ensure compliance with operation and financial regulations and standards. So there's a couple of things that we're doing here. Uh, Vital is procuring a third party to conduct a performance and operational audit, and that's at our urging. Um, so this will be a precursor to uh, the state fiscal year 19 contracts, and they're working on that now. I'll let them provide more detail on that. Evaluate contracts for compliance with state and federal regulations. So that's um, our to do. I'll say that HTS pointed out kind of a twofold need there. They wanted to make sure that we were uh, sure, or adhering to Bulletin 3.5 and any other regulations that we have around contracting, and also just making sure that we're adherent to sort of the federal guidelines. We have a pretty stringent process with the feds now for our contracting. So it goes something like, we request money, we provide scope, timing, and link to the Meaningful Use Program, or what's now called the Interoperability Program. And so we have to demonstrate to them how our work is going to further health information exchange in the state. Um, they approve that. Then they have to approve all procurement documents. So before we release a request for proposal, they review and approve that. Then when we have a contract, they review and approve that before it's signed. And then we provide them monthly progress updates by a written um, progress report, and we also have calls with them. So already the feds have considerable, or what I would consider considerable oversight on our um, sort of planning and procurement processes. And the final objective here is to improve the VHI public reporting to increase transparency. And there's a number of activities listed here, which are all um, under Vitals purview, so I'll speak to that. All right, we're on to the next one. The next goal here, ensure that the VHI operator is focused and delivers upon its core mission, which I think is probably the area that folks are, um, I guess, most concerned about. And so this is on that next page, page six. Sorry, it doesn't have a number. Um, and so again, you see the objectives here listed down the side on the left. Extend Vital's contract with Viva for six months to allow for the completion of the HIE plan. Furthers our objective to use the state's contracts with VITAL to transparently tie program goals to HIE financial investments. So again, we've worked um, with VITAL to really refine the achievement of uh, goals related to them enhancing their core functions that were pointed out by HDS in the evaluation. And we'll continue to use those contracts <coughs> as mechanisms to have those strategic conversations and to um, have some accountability for how we're moving forward um, on sort of solidifying the HIE core functions. Also, um, an objective here is for VITAL to develop a high strategic plan. Um, and here you'll see all of the stakeholders that they will consult with, and I'll let them provide more color on that one. And finally, address issues with the HIE core functions identified in the evaluation report. And at the end of this document, you'll see a contract matrix, which links the HTS recommendation to drivers of success, what, that, what activities would we need to do to actually address that recommendation, what deliverables are related to those drivers, and what's the funding mechanism for achievement of those drivers. So I, I would say that the, the present CEO of Vital asks a really important <laughs> question, which is, so what is success here? How do we define success? Part of the reason that Diva chose to enter into a six-month contract extension is that right now, for us, success is executing upon the recommendations of the HTS report and fulfilling our obligations under H901. I happen to think the most important thing the state can do to answer the question of what is success is to produce a thoughtful, incredible uh, HAE plan for your consideration as a board. And so our thought was that if we extended the contract for a full year, we'd be putting in deliverables that are potentially not aligned with that report. And that would not be a smart way to try to be successful to go. So our hope is, is that as the HIET plan to be submitted to you by November 1st starts to really become, really come into view and become specific, that we can use the recommendations and the directions set forth in that report uh, to develop a further contract extension with VITAL for January 1st, 2019 and going forward. Because we just don't want to be caught in the trap of 
doing something that might not be the right thing. It's just really important that we're all on the same page about what our goals are, so we can probably define them and determine how to get there together. Thanks. So we're on to the next one. Okay, and the final goal set is making Beehive operations accountable to all customers in the state. And the goals that you'll see here are um, very specific to adjusting Vitals board and their um, and our participation on the board. I will say that this is an area that I think we'll look to expand upon. You know, vital sustainability will be dependent on their work meeting their stakeholders, or excuse me, their customers' needs. Uh, so I think we're all really interested um, in working together to support them in um, becoming sustainable. Okay, so to provide a status update on um, other facets of H91, and I'm moving away from the work plan now. I'll just have questions about that. Okay. So one of those um, aspects of H901 is that we develop a contingency plan. Um, this is so we have it available um, should Vital or Diva demonstrate that they cannot actually address the recommendations from the health tech evaluation report. Um, so on the contingency plan front, um, we released an RFP um, and selected a vendor in April. Um, we selected Capital Health Associates, you may be familiar with them. They have been um, in, I'd say, the HIE sphere in Vermont for a number of years. Um, and that was uh, particularly attractive as we're looking to do a very short-term project and we needed someone pretty knowledgeable in the, the area. Um, we expect that they'll begin work um, probably around mid-May, um, and then they'll deliver that contingency plan to the board and the General Assembly by September 1st. So on this next slide here, and should I stop their question? Um, so um, just so we're all clear, the requirements of the contingency plan, and these are written out in each 901. Um, it will include a description of the health information exchange services that need to be replaced, a process for determining the manner in which the services would be replaced, and the mechanism for acquiring the replacement services, such as a request for proposals process, an assessment of the state's ownership interests in hardware systems, software systems, applications, et cetera, that would need to be licensed to a future operator of Vermont's health information exchange, a plan for transitioning operations to new operator and the impact of change on healthcare providers, healthcare consumers, state government, and Vermont's healthcare reform initiatives. So just uh, to conclude, just thinking a little bit about the risks to this plan. Uh, first of all, as I said before, H901 is not passed in the legislature. Uh, if for some reason that bill does not become a law, uh, the HIT fund, the, the ongoing support of the HIT fund would cease, and so we'd have to determine how the state of Vermont would proceed with its HIE, HIT investments in the absence of a dedicated revenue source. Uh, most of this work requires CMS approval. Uh, most of it draws down a significant amount of federal funds. That process is well underway, so we, we think that's a, a modest risk to this work. A more significant risk is capacity which is just a fancy way of saying there is a lot to do in a very short time frame. And so there is not a lot of room for error on the side of DIVA or VITAL or the contractors who are involved in this. Uh, I think we are very focused at DIVA and making sure that the things that we can control are, are well aligned and moving quickly. Uh, but this, this is certainly a serious risk to trying to get this much stuff done between now and the end of the year. Uh, the HAE Steering Committee, they are new. They have never produced an HIE, HIT plan. And so to me, to my mind, that's the most important thing that DIVA can deliver. And so, you know, but we haven't done it before, and so there's always a risk there. Uh, I, you know, none of them are in the room right now, but I, I really want to give them a thank you. They have really taken up uh, the mantle of responsibility here and tried to, done, tried to do the right thing. And they've put an enormous amount of work into helping us figure out what where to start and thinking about what the state might need for HIE. Uh, and then, you know, a little bit, we just think about um, the fact that, you know, this last bullet point is just trying to say, it might be hard for people to see the payoff right away. So as I said before, the four key questions are, what do we want, can Vital deliver it, are providers better off, and are Vermonters better off? Most of the work in H901 is focused on the first two questions. 
What do we want and can Vital deliver it? Uh, you can make a lot of progress on that prior to medical providers and patients seeing a benefit from it. And so one of my concerns is that we can be successful in each aspect of this plan. And when we talk to policymakers next year, they may ask, well, how are patients better off? And, and we might just not be there yet. And so I think people are gonna have to be patient. I know given the history of this work, that it's hard to ask for additional patients. Uh, but I just wanna be very frank with people that you might have sort of a mismatch between people's expectations and actual progress made, because I think a lot of the benefit might be internal to the vendor of the state in the program and less apparent to Vermont's providers and patients, at least in the next eight to 10 months. I think that's all we have, Mr. Chairman. I guess I'll start the questioning, uh, uh, Michael. Um, What's the dollar value of the capital health contract, and is that uh, paid for through the state budget or through Vitals budget? Sure. So um, it's valued at two hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars. It is supported. Well, it is supported with ninety ten dollars. There's some semantics with CMS that we're still going back and forth on, um, and so that ten percent does come from the HIT fund. Mm -hmm. And that they're already working, correct? They have not begun work yet. We're still waiting for CMS to approve their contract, which we expect to come in next week. Okay. And who is specifically from them going to be working on this? So it's um, the three partners, Hans Cassie Smith, Craig Jones, and Katie McGee working in um, collaboration with a legal firm whose name, I'm sorry, I don't remember off the top of my head, but I, we can send that to you as well as a consulting firm called Match Point Partners, and they're a firm dedicated entirely to organizational transitions. I, I think just to add a little more context, uh, given the compressed time frame, it's important that we spend time on the work, um, and we have to be careful about how much time we spend onboarding contractors. And so here you see HTS, the same party that wrote the original report, is back to do more work. Uh, and Capital Health Associates, which is probably more familiar with Vermont's HIE than any other vendor, uh, was the successful bidder there. Um, and I think that, well, there's always the risk of, you know, not having a sort of outside the box thinking that might be helpful. Um, you do get the benefit of people that you don't need to onboard. Like they can hit the ground running. And I think that's important in this project. Any questions? So, um, looking down the road a, a bit to 2021, the expectation from a fiscal point of view is that uh, Vital's budget would be downsized, as I understand it, by about a million bucks, and that they would be um, uh, filling in the mid-year term, I think 2020, with some carry forward, and that um, either when they get to 2021, if the systems have not improved to the point where you know, folks out in the world are, are using vital services and paying revenue for that, that um, uh, it would be further downsized as, as a possibility. Um, and I, 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 I fully appreciate uh, your caution about patience, uh, but I'm wondering um, uh, if we are fully patient, which I intend to be, uh, because this is a heavy lift, um, um, as I see it, um, we have kind of dividing the world up into, into uh, two elements. One are the process elements, which are noted in your handout of all these reports and quarterly reports and contingency plans and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, those in and of themselves won't um, improve the systems. They will guide the improvement of the systems, but won't improve the systems that are needed in 2021 uh, to bring revenue into vital and get it on a self-sustaining uh, basis. And so I'm wondering if there is being too much compressed into uh, these next two years, we're looking at 2019 and 2020, to get us to the point where vital is something that people want to pay for and buy uh, on a voluntary basis. Um, what, what might we expect to be uh, uh, a kind of the most patient about um, in order to direct resources to get to that, that ultimate on the ground performance that we hope for that allows Vital to be self-sustaining. So in our 
previous discussions, so let me, I think it's helpful to characterize some of our past discussions with Vital, which predate the current interim CEO. There was always a focus on sustainability, and that means um, more of Vital being able to pay through it for itself, uh, because people want to purchase it as a service and less state investment, which is the trajectory that most states want to be on with HID. Uh, my candid comments to Vital's leadership at the time was, please focus less on revenue and more on value. Revenue should be a happy consequence of you providing a product that really gives value to Vermont's providers and values to Vermonters as patients in the healthcare system. And I think we are still giving vital leadership that same advice. I deeply appreciate having a roadmap to greater sustainability and less public sector investment. However, what I'm really concerned with is the creation of value. And I think our patients will be tied to our perception of high value services being created at Vital. That prompts the excellent question of, well, how do you judge what's valuable? My hope is that we can use both the HIE plan and getting reactions from it out of the provider community, uh, and hopefully in a future round of Vital contracts, asking them to go back out and do some of the surveying work that was done in the HTS report to try to make sure that we have a good connection to what providers <coughs> and patients will find useful and valuable. And to keep looking at that as an indicator of whether um, more state investment in patients is warranted. What I don't want to do is set an arbitrary benchmark of X percent of revenue needs to come from private fees by Y date. Because I just I, I happen to think that we'll be setting ourselves up to fail. Uh, we should keep um, moving in the direction we're moving and constantly evaluate whether we think we can look in the mirror and say more value is being created by Vital today than was created yesterday. So when Diva says value, what how do you define value as what you're expecting from Vital? When a healthcare provider can turn to me and say, Part of how I care for Vermonters relies upon services we get from Vital or the HIE, then I think value has been created. I mean, I, I know that that is a, a, a sort of abstract and clumsy measure, and I think part of our job is to define that and turn it into something specific and measurable. But, you know, I, I want providers coming to us saying, you know, you give us tools, the Blueprint for Health, you give us tools through the ACO program, you give us tools with our, we have a relationship with federally qualified health centers, you give us tools with Vital, and those tools are important to us and the people we care for. And I want an audience, uh, a constituency rather, telling us that that's important. Because I only want to pay for things with taxpayer dollars that are really meaningful and useful to Vermont and Vermonters. You don't mind to that? The only thing I'd add is that, you know, it wasn't an accident that Health Tech called out specific services as core functions, and that's what we're really concentrating on now, because they theor their theory, which is based on how many other successful HIEs operate, is that if they do, if Vital is able to provide its base service, they need to have a series of core services sort of solidified to add those value-based services on top. So what we're really focusing on now is supporting them and making the foundation of their operations successful so they can move forward. Uh, I just have a question on, um, you highlighted capacity as, as really kind of a major risk. And if you were to look inside Diva as well as Vital, I mean, where do you see that biggest potential issue on which side of the the fence there? I mean, is it, is it equally on both sides, or do you see it more on Vital? Uh, I happen to think it's equally on both sides. Uh, I think Vital, like most partners, is only going to be successful if it has a very clear idea of what its client wants. Uh, so I think the state has a lot of work to do uh, with internally and with its stakeholders and its uh, other vendors like HTS and Capital Health Associates to very clearly ask Vital for what it needs. And so for me, um, one of the tricks is we have a lot of good team members that are willing to work hard on Vital, um, but the, the thought leadership part of this is really hard. And so you know we have to create space for people to do that kind of visioning while keeping the contracts and the process going. 
and it's, it's really hard to do, you know, to kind of build the plane and fly it all at the same time. And so I think that's the big risk because the risk you run is that you either instruct your partner to do the wrong thing or something that's not the wrong thing, but just, just not the thing that's most meaningful. And so I think we have to be really careful that we're focused on what we're telling them to do via the future HIE plan that's delivered to this board and our future contract. And so that, that's a hard part for me. And then, and then the other thing that I worry about um, is that you know, HTS has pointed us towards other states that have had some success, but I think it's fair to say that nobody has figured this out completely. And so you know, our directions are going to be our best guess, but there, there is no turnkey solution to this. We have to make a series of value judgments, and I want to make sure that we're in the best position uh, to succeed with those uh, recommendations to FIDO. So getting back, just to follow up on uh, um, what, you can, what you perceive to be value, and then on, um, you said that the provider found the value. And do you think that the providers are in alignment? What if the, you know, if one provider is a member of uh, an ACO, another provider is completely independent, uh, another provider is in a hospital setting that's not a member of, of an, an ACO. Do you think there's enough alignment on what they consider? I personally, I don't think there is consensus about what people need as tools, uh, but I think the job of the HIE plan and frankly, the job of our overall healthcare reform, which the goal of which is to create an integrated health system across the whole care continuum, is to try to get at those questions. Now, our HIE steering committee is the first group of people who we've pushed really hard to try to answer some of those questions. Uh, I think two things can be equally true. We're very happy with their effort. I think part of the reason we're having them propose a new governance model is because it could be broader. Uh, particularly in adding provider and practitioner voices. Uh, but I, I think that, you know, though we don't have a consensus view, we're working hard to develop more of one. Um, and I, I think that's gonna be one of the tasks, you know, in answer uh, to Mr. Callum's question, that we've gotta be really intentional about continuing to ask people what they want, because otherwise you can fall into a trap of thinking you know what the, the community wants. Um, I will say now, uh, just sort of tying into the work of the board, to the extent we have an accountable care organization program that has 20% you know, of Vermonters in it in year one, we have a partner that we can ask those questions to, and, and though we may not get a perfect degree of certainty, we at least I think we'll get an informed opinion about what a large block of providers might be interested in. Um, and so they are really a key constituency as well in trying to ask what services would be meaningful in helping people care for Vermonters and to create a more integrated healthcare system. Yes. Um, but just to piggyback on that, also thinking about duplicative services, right? One care offering various um, information analytics and things like that. How do we think about those providers that don't even have EMRs that can speak in on boards? I think obviously there's going to be work to be done on the various types of providers and what their input would be. But my question actually was more about um, so much uncertainty in Washington these days. Uncertainty is probably a kind word. Um, and I'm wondering what you're thinking about in terms of future federal funding support for HIT in general and what you're hearing and how that plays into your future planning. So um, our, the, the sort of the funding stream of the act that we function under is called high tech and our high tech CMS representatives were here with us a couple of weeks ago um, and they told us a couple of things. One that, you know, the 90-10 or the federal match we're talking about all falls under a connection to what was called the Meaningful Use Program, which is totally focused on the adoption of electronic health records. And so that will take us through about 2022. And they increasingly, I mean, I think it started every year and now it's becoming every couple of months, are expanding their view on what that means. And I guess that means 
um, allowing for uh, funding of broader initiatives uh, to fall under that. Um, they've also just proposed that Meaningful Use now transitions under uh, interoperability programs at CMS. So they're trying to further think about how CMS continues to have a role in um, achieving what they call interoperability or connecting systems on behalf of patients and providers. Um, there's another funding stream, MMIS, which is the Medicaid management system. Um, every Medicaid agency has one, and they use them in different ways. And CMS is increasingly trying to encourage us to think about how to leverage, as a Medicaid agency, that funding stream to further health information exchange work. So I guess that's all to say they are thinking about the future of this work. Do you want to go? Okay. Um, they are thinking about the future of this work, and the general message that we're getting from them is they're working quickly to, to figure out what continued support looks like. Your, your point about federal uncertainty is really well taken. I mean, we've had to deal with that a lot with the Medicaid agency over the past 17 months, and sort of the, the thing I tell my team is, hey, you know, pray but move your feet. Like, you can't let federal uncertainty paralyze the work. You, you have to keep going. That said, the disappearance of a preferred match rate for this work will not make the need for this work disappear. And so even though it's a few fiscal years off, we have certainly as an administration started to have internal discussions about how you might pay for this if it's an ordinary Medicaid expense as opposed to something with a very preferred match rate. Um, so I think we've started that a couple years in advance. We'll see how that conversation progresses. There's a lot of pieces to that, but it's well taken and it's on our radar. I think the, the best thing that helps you get through difficult pieces of this uh, is to have a good partner. Um, so far, the discussions the last few months with Vital have been very good. They, they've been productive and they've been honest and, and difficult sometimes, but I think we're, we're getting to a better place. Um, we're grateful to be up here today talking about their budget, which we, we do hope that you approve because we think we're on the right track. Um, but you know, this federal uncertainty is something we have to weather together. I have one other uh, comment related to what Jess was asking about in terms of federal funding and also going back to Tom's question around uh, self-sustainability because this has always seemed like a, a tricky balancing act to me in terms of pushing for self-sustainability because I can see how that would improve uh, relationships with the end user, so providers, if providers are paying for it, that makes the organization vital, much more attuned to what they need and want. On the other hand, it does mean it's net more expensive for Vermonters because we'd be losing that federal match. So that's, that's just a comment for you to think about as you're working on the HIT plan because that'll be a, an area that I'll at least want to have some conversation about. I, I think that's exactly right, and that's a component of our discussion internally and with the legislature every year, because to the extent you still need these services, if you pay for them with private dollars, you're in a way making healthcare more expensive. And, and so that is a, now that we have created a lot of federal investment, we have to be very careful about how we would unwind that federal investment. So point is well taken. Any other questions or comments from the board? I want to speak about more. So looking down the road um, and say things work out real well in terms of uh, finding the, the areas of value for providers and responding to them, but across the uh, entire landscape in Vermont, there are some providers that get it and participate, and there are others that should get it but don't participate. Um, from Diva's point of view, would um, would you consider coming to us in situations like that where we have certain regulatory authority over budgets, et cetera, and say, oh, by the way, uh, here's an area where this hospital, for example, might be more efficient if they avail themselves of these proven valuable services that Vital gives? I think we would be, to the extent we identified tools that we thought were essential for the creation of an integrated health system in alignment with all pair model. Um, we would certainly want to be candid with the board about whether they ought to be used and why they're not being used. I, I think that the HIE plan will start to get to your question because it will prompt us to say to ourselves, hey, what problem are we trying to solve here? Um, and, and right now we're trying to solve problems of institutional uh, competency and credibility uh, and to make sure that we are planning well for the future. 
Uh, I think I can imagine a situation in the future where you're trying to solve certain last mile problems. For example, if you had 80% of people doing something that had a really catalytic effect on healthcare reform, and 20% of people who just don't want to do that, I, I think we could find ourselves in the future in a place where we want to solve that problem. Um, but, but right now, we're really laser focused on each 901 and the elements that go into that. If you don't mind me adding, there are already things in place that we can use as um, ways to think about how we want to engage the healthcare system. So, for example, the connectivity criteria that Vital is going to present to you at the end of the year is a great way to establish standards for the type of data that we'd be receiving and exchanging. Okay. At this point, we'll open it up to the public for any uh, questions or comments. Yes, Ken. Um, I, I, first of all, I uh, have a question really to the Green Mountain Care Board because um, it's always been a little unclear as to what the role of the Green Mountain Care Board is, from my point of view, in regards to DIVA and, and VITAL. You know, is it, does the board have the power, for example, to pull the plug on this project, on these projects. Um, you know, this is maybe the fifth presentation that I've heard, or, or tenth presentation that I've heard over four or five years. And there's always kind of an acknowledgement that a whole lot better could be done. And there's been a whole lot of shortcomings. And it's not for lack of trying. Um, it's, it's, this is a complicated part of healthcare reform. But it's never been clear to me that there's a whole new board sitting up there from five years ago, for example, and there was a lot of distress, at least on the part of some board members, about for lack of progress, lack of clarity, and frankly, a lot of pushback from the public and part of the professional community. So my question is, uh, is, is, this, is this, you know, from now into the future, is the board just sort of monitoring, monitoring the kind of um, anticipated progress and improvement that will be made or um, or not, I guess is the question. So I can speak on what my own personal perceptions are. I think H901 is an acknowledgement that um, DIVA has a much more of a role. And so you'll see that if that passes, we would not be um, having uh, a review or oversight of the core activities, but strictly the budget. So the, as I see it, and I could be completely wrong, um, the board still has some powers because uh, if the budget's not approved, I'm not quite sure where they would go from there. I would just add from a straight legal perspective that uh, the legislature established Vital as the vendor for the HIE. So in terms of pulling the plug in, in terms of who operates that, that's to me requires some legislative discussion. But I agree with Kevin. I just, might, I just might add that, you know, the uh, points three and four that um, Mike talked about that they are, uh, you know, are providers better off and are patients better off uh, when that question, and I think that question should be asked um, in uh, by uh, health tech um, solutions or their equivalent in 2021 or so when you know, uh, this effort has had uh, time to breathe. Um, and if the answer comes back similarly then as it did last December, then I think a whole bunch of people will be saying, you know, why do we continue investing in this thing? It just isn't working. And again, I think that the whole purpose of 901 um, if it passes, is to set in motion uh, a set of sequences that creates a contingency plan so that a plug might actually be pulled if deliverables aren't met. Dale. Yeah. Um, this one's confusing. Can 901 really afford not to pass. Well, how can the legislature ask itself that? Because if it doesn't pass and you don't invest in HIT, 
where do you go? I, I mean, the whole market, the, the whole economy of healthcare is that this is a fundamental building block now moving forward. So what do I invest in is a question that's very relevant. But do I invest? I'm not sure. Is the legislature on the right track if it even tries to ask that question? Or is that a question that really doesn't make sense? So the legislature is always on the right track. <laughs> <laughs> Dale, I would just say three quick things. One, the legislature, um, you know, they've, they've applied a lot of scrutiny to 901, but I would just say they've been very fair in providing us with some room to do work to try to improve this, recognizing that uh, this is not the first time that Diva and Vital have said this is a tough challenge and, and we need time and energy and space to try to take on this challenge. Uh, as far as <clears throat> what would happen if for some reason the bill did not pass, as I said before, uh, the need for this work does not go away even if the funding source goes away. And so the administration would have uh, to talk about at what level could it support HIT with the present Medicaid expenditures and have a dialogue with the legislature about uh, the next year's Budget Adjustment Act. And, and then also, you know, it's, it's easy in shorthand to talk about pulling a plug. Nothing in life is that simple. If we were to ever wind down our relationship with VITAL, we would have to be really careful about how to do that. I think the existence of the contingency plan work acknowledges just how complex that could be. And so I think regardless of what happens, we, were, we are in sort of a, a longer relationship with VITAL to make sure we are being responsible about whatever's next. So I, I like H901 because it gives us an it gives the state an opportunity and vital an opportunity to be really intentional about the future uh, and try to think about how things look if we succeed wildly, how things look if we're not able to succeed, and what happens if we just continue struggling with a problem that many states have found particularly difficult. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Sure. This is of the board. Therefore, based on what he said, the general well, that's all true. Can the board recommend, or is this too political, to the legislature and the governor how important it is that something has to pass in H901? So I guess I would ask Michael this question because I'm sure he's following that portion of the budget more closely than I have. But I'm not so sure that the dollars are necessarily uh, linked in the budget to the passage, are they? Yeah, it's, it's really the, the claims tax, the portion of the claims tax that supports the HIT fund uh, is due to sunset on June 30th. And so the most important part of the legislation is the continuation of that funding source for the HIT fund. And so it's, it's the existence of, existence of the fund and the revenue source that, that are most key to, the, to that piece of it. Well, our so our spending authority is in the budget as to what's in the IDL fund when it comes to that. I mean, we, there's language in the budget about our spending, but the administration's spending authority on HIT. And so uh, we, I believe we would still have, we would potentially have that unless someone took both of those things. However, um, we would have to have a, without the anticipated funding source, we would have to have a difficult conversation about how much of that appropriation it would be prudent to spend. Uh, I would just say to, to Dale and other folks is that nothing is certain until everything is done at the legislature, but so far we've had a very collaborative process uh, on 901, and, and we're optimistic that we'll be given the next fiscal year to try to execute on the plan that was described today. Thank you. Other questions or comments from <coughs> If not, we thank you, uh, Michael and Emily. Thank you. And this time, if we could have uh, Mike Robert and Christina come up.
I'm the Interim Chief Technology Officer for Vital. Hi, I'm Bob Turneau. I'm the CFO for Vital. I'm Christina Shoket. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Vital. Let me, let me just start with an update. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for uh, taking our time, taking your time this afternoon for this review of our FY19 budget. I'll also entertain any sort of uh, questions on uh, the work plan, but as you, we seek your approval for this budget, um, you can see that we're probably a much smaller institution than your much larger institutions that you normally look at budget review and approve. And we really appreciate the time and effort that the staff put into the questions, I think it's important, and I'll get into that in a minute, why I think it's important, why we use this budget document as a planning document for not only FY19, but FY20 and 21, and, and how we incorporated some of the things that Michael talked about in terms of core responsibilities as well as trying to open up questions about vital. I think more conversation is better. I wanted to get to a couple of things. I have been following H901. It has passed the Senate. It's passed the House. It's passed the Senate with amendments. We were uh, very active in the Senate in terms of trying to make sure that the bill had a few amendments on it. The, the First Amendment dealt with how we establish if we're making progress. And one of the things that the House version had was the, a declarative statement that said in June of 2019, Vital's exclusivity to, the, uh, to run the Beehive would end. And what we said in the Senate, and I, I think the Senate, and I, I believe the House understands this as well, is the problem with that is no matter what we do, even if we're successful, the legislation says that the BHI exclusivity with vital will end. The Senate has put in a, a uh, amendment to that, uh, uh, to that language that says it's tied to the work plan. Let's tie to success to the work plan and that amendment was put in. The second amendment actually came from a discussion that we had here when I first was here. It came from um, uh, board member at lunch when she says, wait a second, it's kind of, you know, you're, you're trying to change the composition of your, of your board as is, re as is suggested in the HTS report, but guess what? It's in legislative statute. Some former secretary of administration put it in legislation what the board makeup would be. One of this, one of that, one of, one of this. And that former secretary of administration should be admonished for that. But nonetheless, the, the bill now, the amendment gives us broad categories within uh, various healthcare institutions where we can um, look for in terms of reconstituting the board. The last amendment that we suggested was that, and it came from this board again, was the consent issue. This is a huge issue. It's a huge issue that we have not looked at in the past because it is a controversial issue. But I think it's a needed conversation that we must have, not in the sort of a legislative combat mode, 
but in sort of taking and getting everybody around the table and discussing this. And I was pleased that the administration, the legislature, and the Senate have decided to let's start that conversation about opt-in, opt-out. And I think that's an important conversation to have. We had, um, it has passed the Senate. There has been a last minute amendment on it. Um, we were hoping that the House would concur. We don't know with this amendment. This amendment is sort of non-germane. Well, I can't say that. It's germane because it's on the piece of the legislation. But it hasn't anything to do with the legislation. It basically, what it does is establish a joint legislative IT uh, committee, sort of like joint fiscal committee uh, on IT projects. That has been attached. I don't know what the House will do at that point. As, as Michael had talked about, as the Deputy Commissioner had talked about, this is, uh, in that legislation, is the claims authorization. Um, as you know, that authorization has to be resubmitted every year and reauthorized every year. It used to be every three years, now it's every year, and the legislature is moving forward on that. I just wanted to give you an update on that. I do want to thank Diva in particular, Michael and Emily, for all the sort of um, assistance and dedication that they've had in coming up, not only with our budget, but the work plan. I think it's important. I was the one, as Michael had talked about, I was the one they asked the question, what is success? Don't we really need to fundamentally understand what success is? And if you look at the work plan, if you look at the contract, there's a tying in of those HTS recommendations in all of that, uh, whether it's the contract extension or not. Like I said, I really thank the board for the opportunity to put this budget together. You will see that this submission is much broader, much more in detail than you have seen previously. That's because this, we use this document as a planning process for us to look not only in fiscal year 19, but into the future. We also thought, and we understand when you provide a lot more information, you'll get a lot more questions, and certainly we saw, we saw that we did get a lot more questions, but that's good. Because what we believe is that not only here at the Green Mountain Care Board, but elsewhere, we need to have this conversation. We need to be talking about direction, and we need to be talking about what the feedback is to the direction that we're going. I'll give a short overview of the budget, and then Bob will provide some of the budget detail as well as a follow-up. Um, and I want to follow up on some of the themes of the budget because there are themes in this budget. Frank Harris, our interim chief technology officer, and as we transition, that position will transition to, a, it has already to a director level. Ultimately, uh, uh, Frank will be our part-time technology strategist uh, instead of a, a chief technology office, and he'll talk about tech, technology. and. Um, Christina will talk about some of the things we're doing in operations and Q3. Uh, so without any further ado, if we could um, sort of, well, you've got it already up there, uh, Bob. Let's just go to the slide deck. We thought it was important to sort of lay out the priorities. And if you look at this budget, what you will find is that we are transitioning to a leaner and more focused organization. And that includes $1 million in reduction from state revenues over FY19 and FY20. And in, in, we're talking about something that Michael talked about and Emily talked about services. How do we enhance our services? How do we sort of look at priorities that really make a difference in this FY19 budget? There are six priorities as we see it. Increase the number of Vermonters who consent to have their data viewable, viewable in the beehive. And there are two ways of doing that. Electronic consent, which we've had success in doing in the last six months, and legislatively, which we hope to have success talking about that aspect as well. If you look nationally, those that have opt-out are roughly 92% participation rate, roughly. 
And if you look at those that have opt-in, we're, we're at, uh, right now, 32%. Rhode Island's at 50%, just over 50%. So this is a very important question as we go forward. Better matching of our patients with their records. Um, and we'll discuss that as we, as we go along with either with Frank and Christina. Implement easier ways to access the data. We've heard a lot about, well, you've got this, uh, this way of accessing vital access, but what about incorporating into our EHR? And that's something that, that I think is fair and something that we have to explore and how to do. Improve our quality through terminology services and upfront connect, uh, connect, connection criteria. And we'll talk about that. Manage the security of the VHI. Frank will talk about that. And promote transparency. We're going to probably be a little bit more active on the airways and the press and other places and talk about what we do and how we do it. I think it's important, and this budget document is one way to do this. Our FY19 objectives are regain confidence, regain credibility of our vital clients, including the state of Vermont, by addressing the recommendations from the Act 73 report. And that's a theme in this budget presentation. Now, vital short-term and long-term focus to get to a question I heard later, how, what is value? Well, value is high quality data, value is strategies to ensure accurate and complete health records, value is efficient, effective, useful delivery to providers, and value is collaboration with our partners. It's also imperative because we talk about a lot about state government, but we have other clients that are out there. One Care Vermont, for example, is one of the other clients that we have, have out, out there. We can't forget about those value-added products that we provide out there. I think it's important um, to remember those products as we, as we move forward. The FY19 budget is balanced, but we said, let's look forward. Let's not only look at FY19, Actually, looking at FY19 is easier. Looking three years ahead is much more difficult as you look ahead because you've got to think and anticipate what's going on. And looking ahead, we see that FY20 uh, budget is balanced through the use of carry forward monies. FY21 is, is budgeted through providing value added products to state government and Vermont providers. We will need approximately $500,000 in FY21 to talk about sustainability. So the risks. We're a lean organization. We have talent that's there, good talent that's there, and that's good being a lean organization because it means that it increases efficiency. But the loss of crucial talent could have an impact on effectiveness. Now, we've tried to mitigate that by um, cross-training and by organizationally bringing the organization not through a silo system, but to bring it together in a more constructive way. An unfavorable HTS follow-up evaluation could have an impact on state contracts. We have legacy reconciliation issues that um, need to be settled within the parameters of the reserve. Our reserve over that reserve could impact the budget. Uh, Vital must meet its NIST requirements, and I'll have Frank talk about that. And then the budget items must trend as planned. The next two slides are something that staff gave me when I first walked in the door so I could understand what was going on and what we were doing in terms of what the VHI is. And it is a, it is a database that are used by hospitals, primary uh, specialists in cares like the FQHCs, uh, home health hospices, commercial laboratories, medication services, mental health, and nursing homes. But there's also another side where that information is used. And if you, if you go to the next thing, this is a infrastructure that provides data to the Vermont 
accountable care organizations, the Vermont Department of Health Immunization Registry, the Vermont Blueprint for Health Clinical Data Registry, uh, Patient Ping, and the BCCI, which is the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative as well. There is another side. You'll hear us talking about medicity. You'll hear us talking about HDM. HDM is this component. Medicity is the first component that I talk, that I spoke to. Um, there's there's a there's a point on this slide that I, uh, that when 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 it was included in this slide, I didn't think two things about it. But as information starts coming in, I, I want to make sure that I. Um, that I'm really clear on this slide. It says potential support to other regions and states. We're not interested right now in going into other states or doing other things. What we're interested in is, is the record following the patient. And how do we do that? At Dartmouth, at Plattsburgh, how do we, how do, we do that? And how do we make sure that that record is following the patient? That's, that's what we mean by that. With that, I'll turn it over, unless there's any immediate questions, I'll turn it over to Bob, who is much more proficient at knowing the details than I am. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon. I'd like to go through some charts um, that are relevant to our FY19 budget this afternoon. But before I start, I'd like to thank Agatha Kessler and Sarah Kensler for their guidance and patience with us helping us to get to uh, this point with the presentation uh, where we are providing the board with um, the data that informs their decision. So, and thank you. Our FY19 budget was shaped by many factors. The budget was developed from a review and assessment of vitals cost at its lowest level by the person and by the vendor. We compared what we have spent with what we anticipate those expenses to be in FY19. The above assumptions are what Vital sees as the most important in terms of our budget for FY19. First and foremost is that we need to complete uh, the contract extension requirements. Second is that the award of the follow-on contracts um, must occur on January 2019. And as Mike has noted, we also need to maintain our critical skills and talent to make this all happen. Next, we need to achieve cost uh, reductions and maintain those for the future. And then finally, we need to complete the transition from our um, HDM hosting service rack space to Tech Vault. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in future slides. If we look at revenue, this budget incorporates a $500,000 reduction in state funding to the FY19 budget. And in addition, it decreases the FY20 state funding by another half a million dollars. The FY20 forecast is just here to illustrate what we would anticipate um, the funding to look like in that fiscal year. Our major funding from the state comes through two contractual vehicles. There is a core contract, which you see above, which covers the VHI operations and maintenance and the APD, or otherwise known as the Advanced Planning Document, which establishes and remediates interfaces. These are the connections between healthcare organizations and the VHI. In addition, this contract ensures high quality data being transmitted to the VHI and supports the HCOs with exchange and access of health data information. Can you just go back to the revenue slide again? Sure. Can you just talk about uh, the decrease in the other state contracts and lying over time? Okay. 
Sure. Um, in Okay, specifically um, the last line in other state contracts, that should have read, um, the bulk of that is the SIM contract, which um, has since, uh, those funds have, their availability has um, been eliminated by the federal government. So over time, um, this has um, gone away as a funding vehicle for us in, FY18, there actually is um, a small amount of carry forward of another contract from FY17, about $147,000 that was attached to uh, specific projects that were delayed until September of 2017. In addition, in the FY18 forecast, we have a project for VCCI which is a small project around $72,000. It's split between 18 and 19, um, with a balance in 19. Um, did that answer your question? So what's the 42,000 for in 19? It's the VCCI contract. It's the balance of that work, the completion. And what is the work? That is to build a uh, what's called a VPN, uh, a virtual uh, private network, and stand up a, a very small data mart with the VCCI so that they can access their data um, that's coming from the VHI. This next chart is intended to show the extensions of the current state contracts and the follow-on contracts that we believe that will be awarded at the beginning of 2019. We expect that the follow-on contracts will be a full year in length, spanning the second half of FY19 and the first half of FY20. We anticipate that the discussions will, with the state will begin in late summer and conclude in the fall. As, as of right now, we have no indications that uh, this situation will um, not come to pass. This next chart is a summary of vitals expenses by year. Um, our budget here uh, matches uh, cost with the reduced revenue and incorporates investments in investment technology to enhance security, um, improve patient matching and data quality as recommended in the HDS report. And in addition, it reduces future costs by helping us migrate from Rackspace to Tech Vault, and that positions us to future savings um, with a move, move to more cloud-based uh, technologies. Personnel is the largest component of bias. Can you go back to one slide for a second? Sure. One of my questions was about the education and outreach declining over time fairly significantly with this, you know, at the same time a goal of increasing consent. And I understand there could be a legislative change that could, you know, help with opt out. But if that doesn't happen, it seems like education and outreach is the methodology through which you're going to increase consent. So can you just talk a little about that line? Um, unfortunately, we have um, been faced with reductions in, in funding, and um, one of the areas of education and outreach was our, our summit, um, and we have eliminated that from the 18 budget and also the 19 budget, and in doing so, um, to match our staff with our funding, we eliminated um, two individuals who were associated with marketing or otherwise known as educational outreach to match um, with the revenue. 
Let, let me try to answer that question because it is an important question as, as, you, as you have alluded to. The e-health specialists at the time were out there trying to talk um, to various people about using uh, vital access and helping them along the way. We do have people that are still doing that. But you raise a really good question on education and outreach. If we have opt out, we're going to have to if we're we're going to have to switch those people's responsibility, existing staff's responsibility, to that outreach effort to make sure that people understand. We're also going to have to outreach ourselves in terms of using earned media and other avenues in order to make sure that's going to happen. There is. The outreach that you're seeing the reduction in is different than the outreach. It would, it, there was a lot with the conference. There was a lot with um, providing outreach through these e-health specialists. We have redesigned that and how we're doing it. But you're absolutely right. We're going to have to focus those people that, that are doing that sort of work now on the aspect of our power. We're in, we're in FY 2020 to talk about that at, at that point. But if you don't have opt out. We don't, we don't get to opt out from the legislative process. Then we're an opt in. And how are we going to achieve the levels of consent that we want without right. outreach and education? So I mean, I feel like in some ways, yeah, the, right now we're doing, here's what we're doing, and I'll have Christina talk about this in a little while, but here's what we're doing. We are actually using electronic consent to increase our, our uh, our consent levels to that. We also are sending out these staff members to go out and work with the various providers in order to use the uh, vital access and other uh, other capabilities that we do have. It, they're in the budget. It's just not designated as education and outreach, but they are in this budget. And they have cross purposes now in terms of both what they do. I think it's important. I think you raise another really good point. There's going to come a point when we plateau. But we've shown significant increase in consent in terms of what we've been doing with the electronic version of consent. But there's going to come a point where we plateau, and it's probably going to be around the 50% level uh, at some point. And no matter what we do, whether we educate or or continue to try, we'll, we'll continue to try to strive for that. There's going to come a point where a significant difference is going to be between opt-in and opt-out. Thank you, Mike. Personnel costs are the largest component of vitals expenses. They make up about 50% of VITAL's total expenses. They have been decreasing over time since FY16 when they represented 57% of VITAL's total expenses. This budget keeps our labor costs flat and also reduces some of our employee benefits to, again, fit within the funding envelope um, that exists. As Mike mentioned, VITAL is a lean organization. We have been staffed for the available funding. While we are one deep in some skills, we are still capable of meeting our contractual requirements. However, there is no margin for error. As Mike mentioned, we are employing techniques to establish redundancies within the skill set of employees through cross-training, engaging, uh, technology consultants to assist in the event of a loss of a critical skills employee, and we've reorganized to promote coordination between our teams. Vital's headcount has declined by 7 or 22 percent since FY17. These reductions have been across the board, but the largest has been in administration. Um, our FY17 budget has no new positions in it. Okay. Moving on to medicity, 
They are our largest vendor. They have been the hosting vendor for the V High since 2011 when a competition was held to replace GE Healthcare. Our contract with Medicity expires in June, but we expect to renew it at the same terms. Most of Medicity's costs are monthly charges with the exception of the interface connectivity. So their costs have been relatively stable over the past few years. We expect them to remain stable in FY17. 19, excuse me. Our next component of vitals expenses at 17% of total expenditures is information technology expenditures. These cover expenses for data security, network services and maintenance, and software licenses and services for things such as the HDM, terminology services, and of course, um, our indirect IT related expenses. This also includes, this estimate also includes an expansion of our terminology services efforts into what is called CCD parsing, which is taking an electronic document and breaking it down into usable pieces of information for healthcare organizations. This effort has been discussed in our six month work plan and it is one method of improving the quality of data being transmitted to the VHI, which is a core function of VITAL. There are also new projects that are linked to the HDS recommendations, such as improving project, uh, improving matching by patients, which are also in our budget. In FY19, 70% of our total cost is going to programs, while 29 or 30% is indirect. This 70% was a benchmark used in the HTS report. It is illustrative um, of a number that shows how much effort um, is going to productive um, efforts under contract. Our, in our environment, we are working on contracts where this number is less of a, a relevant number than it would be with a grant. Um, it is sensitive to changes in, in the base, that is labor and material. Um, and as you can see, it's been, the indirect expense has been relatively um, stable over the past several years. Moving on to the balance sheet. Let, let me just, if, if I could, uh, when you come into an organization, you look, look at a few things. One is the overall personnel cost, and in the vital case, it's 50%. If you match that with other organizations, you'll find that this is below what the average is to most other organizations. When you look at it, you see how efficient you're going to be in terms of your use of personnel. And if you look at it, Vital has eliminated its, um, its overall sort of administrative headcount, which is good, by the way. And then you look at where you're investing, at least I do, where you're investing. And technology, given that we're a technology sort of company, a healthcare technology company, investing in technology seems to be the sort of the right trend to go. And then lastly, this is a, the last chart I looked at was the indirect rates. You always look at the indirect rates. How much are you spending on programs versus how much are you spending up for, on a, a, sort of the administrative aspect of it? All of which, these slides were included, I think that to show that A, thought it was being efficient in terms of what it's trying to do and the efficiency and investing in the right things in order to meet the core requirements 
uh, that we uh, we have that have been established for us and that we have agreed to. I'll spend a few moments on our balance sheet. Um, it's a relatively simple one. Uh, most of Vital's assets are current in nature, or such as cash and accounts receivable. Our cash on hand is projected to be $1.2 million at the end of FY19. This represents about 78 days of cash on hand. Typically, organizations are looking to have around 90 days of cash on hand. Um, for us, this, this represents really um, a good place to be given um, our previous visits to the Green Mountain Care Board um, and our discussions regarding uh, the availability of cash. Um, one final note on, on the balance sheet is the minor amount that really the property plan and equipment makes of vital. Um, and that pp and &E, if you will, is made up of three elements. It's the leasehold expenses of our office, around 25,000. It is also um, laptops that our staff use, which are around $17,000 of netbook value. And finally, it is the network infrastructure that we are using to run the HDM, and that's about $96,000. Just a question on cash. With, um, you're seeing quite a favorable shift on the balance sheet with um, receivables going down and payables going up, mm -hmm. which you know is, is obviously a way to help manage that. But you know the fact that they're going the opposite direction. Um, how are you managing that? What risk do you see on cash? Because I think you're seeing about uh, AR decrease of about four hundred forty thousand year over year and an increase in prepaids and accrued of like 210. So I would just say that that could present a risk to your cash position if in fact you don't shift that. So you know, quite a bit of that's balance sheet management. Yes, um, what I would say is that in terms of the reduction in AR, um, there is a significant rollover of cash from FY18 into FY19 due to uh, a number of factors. One is just the cash conversion uh, process is around 50 days. So there is a sizable component from FY18 that is rolling over into FY19, along with um, the billing uh, shutdown that happens at the end of of June. And those two things combined with uh, affect the first part of FY19, being that there is more revenue coming in in FY18 than FY19. So it's just a concern because you're starting the year with 650000 in cash, right? You're, you're starting to 18. Um, mm -hmm. Ending June 18 was 647, and then ending the year with a million two um, in cash on a year where you have 90,000 change. You know. Un understand. So it's just, it's just, I mean, I think you're watching it, but it's certainly, you know, when you look at that cash flow management and just being at 78 days, there's a potential risk there um, on turning receivables and increase in payables. Understand. So if we move on to liabilities, uh, FIDO has very minimal liabilities. The majority, as um, has been noted, is our payables, um, which constitute about 40 days of payables. We have no debt, even though we have a, a line of credit which we have not used. Um, we believe that our payables balance is easily covered by our projected cash uh, 
position. And then finally, our budget includes the capital outlays for FY19, which cover funds to reduce Vital's office footprint, um, and this will aid in saving us money in the future, and also to expand the network infrastructure, especially memory. We're currently using about a terabyte worth of, or increasing a terabyte worth of memory every month. Um, to conclude my presentation, I'd like to thank the Green Mountain Care Board for their thoughtful consideration of VITAL's budget and activities and look forward to a favorable response to our budget approval request. Could you just explain to us a little bit about what TechVault is? Why don't, we, uh, why don't we let the tech guy do it? <laughs> so so uh, to host the systems that Vital uses to process uh, the, the patient data uh, requires that they be hosted in a data center. Um, and uh, those are special facilities that are purpose built to house servers. Um, and a company like Vital is not, you know, doesn't want to be in the business of building data centers. Um, they're very expensive facilities. So we get, so we get that service from um, a service provider in some fashion. Um, historically, Vital has gotten it from a service provider called Rackspace. Um, and Vital is transitioning away from that provider and um, is, is um, transitioning into a different provider called TechVault. And that's a, that's a company that's um, in South Burlington, Vermont, and, and they basically um, house um, uh, servers for companies in, in the state of Vermont as one of their customers, as a matter of fact. So, so um, that's what it is. Do you do any um, geographic diversification to protect against a natural disaster so that um, if something freak were to happen, you still have the integrity of the information is intact. Yeah, I, I, I will speak a lot about that in, in the presentation, but um, the, um, the status that Vital is in right now is, um, as, as Mike talked about, there's sort of two large pieces to Vital's architecture. The Medicity system is, the, is what I think of as the point of care system. That's the system that clinicians use to look at their patient's data while they're caring for patients. Um, that is hosted with Medicity, and they, ha and they have that capability. They host it in two different data centers, and they have a disaster recovery capability to transition from one to the other if there's a physical um, uh, problem with one of the data centers. On the HDM side of it, um, that capability is not where it needs to be today. And so part of the technology initiatives that we have identified in the near term is to improve that capability. So today it's hosted at TechVault, and we have plans to, um, to basically create a diverse um, hosted um, instance of that in, in the cloud. Um, and uh, I'll talk about that when I go, go through the strategic initiatives. Okay. We shouldn't jump ahead. Yeah, right. why, don't, why don't you waltz right into what Yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> Glad to. Um, so so uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk with all of you today. I mean, it's my pleasure to tell you about uh, the technology function within Vital and sort of what we see as the important plans uh, going forward. Um, can everybody hear me all right? Okay. Um, so next slide, please. I think um, if, if you had a chance to read the uh, technology strategic plan, um, you'll, you'll see that you know, I think it's extremely important that um, the technology doesn't exist for its own purposes. Um, it's, you know, we're not in the business of, of building elegant infrastructures, and that's not our objective. It's to support the company's objectives and the company's mission. And so the technology objectives, the, th the areas that the uh, technology function can impact on, really align um, it's right uh, directly with the priorities that Mike talked about a few minutes ago for Vital. So, and they also align directly with um, what was identified in the Act 73 report, the HTS report, around the core services that, that Vital needs to focus on and do well and provide. Um, and those are data quality, um, data availability and ease of use, uh, patient matching, patient consent, and data security and privacy. And so I'll talk about each one of those and some of the um, initiatives that we have planned in those areas. Let me go to the next slide. Um, so the strategic initiatives that we're talking about here, the first one um, is really in response to the, um, what the Act 73 report called out, where it, it identified that there a potential concern of Vital's architecture being complex. 
and, and, and talked about uh, looking at the opportunity to, to consolidate the infrastructure under a single vendor. And so Mike talked about the, uh, the role that Medicity has played, and I talked about that's the point of care system. The other half of the infrastructure is the HDM infrastructure, the health data management infrastructure. And two or three years ago, Vital made a decision to self-develop that side of the infrastructure. Um, at the time, the, the vendor Medicity did not have a product offering in this area, and they do today. Um, and so we're taking a critical look at that direction to see if that's the direction that we ought to continue with. Um, my, my philosophy, what we um, uh, underlined as one of the strategic principles in the um, strategic plan for technology, is that a company like Vital shouldn't self-develop uh, capabilities like this unless they provide unique value or their um, self-development provides a more cost-effective path. Otherwise, um, generally speaking, our direction should be to buy capabilities like this. Um, and uh, so we're looking at that now. Um, there's a sort of a pretty significant curveball that we had in the past week or so, which, which I think is, is potentially a positive thing, but it's going to make it hard for us to um, really get to closure on this as quickly as we had hoped. And that is that um, you know, we've learned that our vendor Medicity is, being, is potentially being acquired, has agreed to be acquired by another company called Health Catalyst. And Health Catalyst has very significant capabilities around uh, the, what the HDM does um, or on the data analysis side of things. And so we're going to be following those developments very closely, and we want to see um, you know, how those go. Sometimes those acquisitions can be really positive events for a company like ours, and sometimes they, they aren't. I mean, it all, a lot depends on um, what the acquiring company, what they're intending to do with the product. It's pretty early days to give a read on that, but, but um, I, I'm op cautiously optimistic that, that, um, it, that what you're looking for is that your current um, software capability is a nice fit with the acquiring vendor and, and you know, that you might wind up with an outcome where the capabilities get rounded out a lot better. So, so we're going to be following that development. And, and uh, I think really uh, any technology function within a company ought to um, always be looking with a critical eye at their strategy. And, and, and so I see beyond just that the Act 73 report called for us to do this, I think we ought to be always, always doing this as a company. So. Um, the, what was DR before you go on? Oh, I'm sorry, disaster recovery. So that's what you exactly what you were asking about before. Um, so the, the the ability to recover into another geographic location, um, and uh, so in the in the next area, um, continuing to advance the infrastructure approach and minimizing overhead costs. And and I, I look at this as you know the the idea is to meet the mission with the infrastructure at the minimum cost because really at the end of the day building hardware infrastructure for a company like Vital is an overhead cost. And, and so as we talked about improving our disaster recovery capabilities, streamlining the current um, architecture because it's in transition, so to shed the rack space infrastructure that I talked about and consolidate it as planned uh, two or three years ago to, um, into the tech vault um, infrastructure. And then a likely move into a cloud-based infrastructure. And you may have, you know, some of you may be familiar with those strategies, but there are providers like Microsoft and Amazon that are providing infrastructure as a service to companies like ours today. And um, they really provide some very significant opportunities to a company like Vital. Um, you can scale your capacity up and down um, as needed very rapidly without um, uh, capital acquisitions of hardware. Um, you can um, you can get your your capacity just in time. Like when you're buying your own hardware, you're always buying it in a sort of a step function in chunks, and you have to plan for future capacity. And so some of it sits idle until you grow into it. Um, and in a cloud-based um, approach, you can get it just in time. Um, you can you can avoid periodic large investments when you need to grow your infrastructure, and instead you have a more predictable and consistent um, uh, expense over time. And like I said, there's an opportunity to reduce overhead because large scale providers like Microsoft and Amazon uh, can achieve economies of scale that a small company like Vital can. So big opportunities there. Isn't one of the barriers that you would put forward um, the cost to shift them to the cloud? 
Uh, I think that the, you know, first of all, the first thing I would say is we're going to take a really hard look at this from a business perspective and make sure that the economics are there before we make a move. And we'll be collaborating with our partners at Diva um, in, in all the decision making that we do here. But, but um, we, we won't make the transition unless the economics are there. My belief is that, that um, and I think what we will find is that, that the, the costs of a transition are going to be more than covered by the savings and the, um, the improvements that I talked about. And that's why you're seeing really, I think in the, in the IT industry, a sea change um, of companies going to cloud-based infrastructures. It, generally speaking, the trend in the industry is to shed owned infrastructure and to, to buy it as a service. Yeah, so, I agree with you. I think long-term is just about that higher cost before you get the savings and the timing of that. Yeah, the- Based on your you know, financial situation and some yep. other things. It's a bit of a challenge, but I get the cloud is where ultimately yeah. people end up. Yeah, the, the costs actually are, are, I think, we'll find are surprisingly modest. And, and, and the reason is that um, Vitals technology is already what's called virtualized. So today, servers don't, you know, just run on, you don't buy hardware every time you want to um, have another server. It's really implemented in software. And that software lends itself to being shifted to different hardware platforms very readily and, and, and at um, relatively low cost. So, so we called out, our forecast was $100,000 to make that uh, transition. And I think we could see that return very rapidly. So, and besides the other ben benefits. So, but, but you know, I, would, I would want to say, take that with a grain of salt, because like I said, we'll be taking a really hard and detailed look at this before we make the shift. So next slide, please. Uh, in the area of data quality, um, data quality is really a multi-dimensional uh, issue, of course, and, and there are a lot of parties that have a part to play in data quality. Uh, for example, the source organization needs to collect the data properly, um, just as one example. Uh, but but um, certainly, I think the, the first four bullets on this slide call out what I would see is the, the, the real clear mandates that where, where Vital needs to play a strong role in data quality. And the first one is as a catalyst for data standards. It's, it's one thing to say that you have, cons you know, that someone has concerns about data quality, but that's not in and of itself actionable. It has to be specific. It has to be something that you can really measure and act on. And, and really at the end of the day, data quality, you could say is adherence to standards. And so um, the reason I said a catalyst for data standards is because that's not a unilateral process. Vital shouldn't be setting the standards by itself, but involving its, its many partners um, in deciding what those things are, but that's key to measurability. Um, the next one is uh, certainly um, familiar to you from the work plan that um, was discussed earlier, um, and that's to support the formal data governance function with very open participation um, by the, the impacted parties. And I anticipate that the technology function will need to support that um, activity, and um, it's extremely important to make decisions about the data. Um, it, advancing the capability to measure data quality with actionable information, like I talked about, it has to be measurable and vital is in really a unique position as the holder of the data to be able to analyze the data and measure where we stand in terms of the quality and what the gaps are and what the issues are so that they can be acted on. And then advancing the maturity of terminology services to standardize data. And Mike talked about this, but um, really, when you're, when you're thinking about um, improving data quality, there's, um, there's improvements that need to be made at the source, for example. So, so let's say a healthcare organization doesn't collect a piece of data. Um, well, that, that can't be remedied centrally if it's not collected in the first place. And so the source um, organizations need to be part of the solution. But a lot can be and should be done centrally um, by VITAL to improve data quality. An example would be if organizations collect the data in different ways, sometimes that can be very tightly tied to their business processes. There are a lot of endpoints involved, and it can be difficult to change those things at all the endpoints. And centrally, the data can be translated um, and, and standardized so that it can be used in a common way. And that's what terminology services do. Um, so, um, and then um, finally, um, working with others to develop an overall systematic approach to data quality management. Like I said, there's a lot of players in this. 
so the next slide. Patient matching, um, you know, I sort of emphasized, you know, in, ita in italics here, that this is a really core capability because to me, um, a lot of the value proposition that Vital pro should provide is, is that it, it can collect data from diverse sources and unify it in a patient record. And that's, that's really fundamentally a lot of what the promise of health information exchange is. And so we have to be excellent at this. Um, and and um, the, um, as we look at this, you know, there, there's um, patient matching capabilities that we have with our vendor today, and Christina's going to talk about some of the work that we're doing to leverage those and improve the current state of the database, which is very important. But we think that ultimately we need to add technology, um, add a master patient index capability to the technology mix to really um, improve the um, situation here. And it's got to be, um, you know, our, our, the principle that we will drive this by is that it's got to be unified across the entire architecture. And so we're looking at solutions there. It's a, it, it, what I'm saying in the next bullet is that, that um, there's a cost challenge there. Um, these aren't inexpensive tools, but, but they are also tools that have a high degree of interest in a lot of the participants in the system. So for instance, the accountable care organization, that's a really essential capability for them to be able to look at their patient's care across the entire um, healthcare system. The Blueprint for Health um, wants to leverage that because they're trying to look at the entire care for patients. The Vermont Department of Health already has a master patient index that they have self-developed and they have um, people who work full time uh, maintaining that. Um, we've had some very early discussions with them, but we know that they would, we, they would love to be part of a unified solution um, as opposed to their own solution. And so there's an opportunity to um, partner with a number of parties here to, to meet the cost challenge, but also I think the mandate has to be, it's got to serve the purposes of all those parties. We don't want five or six master patient indexes operating in the state. We, we really want to try to have one. So um, when we intend to do that as we look at this question. And then data availability and ease of use. Um, I was a clinical information systems manager in uh, Vermont's Academic Medical Center for a number of years. Christina was a clinical information systems manager at Dartmouth. Um, and we both know from experience that, that uh, healthcare um, providers, um, they're, they're extremely dedicated to providing quality care for their patients, but they also have enormous time pressures on them. And they have to do that extremely efficiently. And, and you may have great data on your patients, but if it's hard to use and it's cumbersome, they're not going to use it, and so and and um, they they really hate having to use multiple systems because it's time consuming for them. And so we're we're really focused on trying to integrate to electronic health records to make it as easy as possible for them to view uh, data from Vital right within their workflows that they're already um, involved in. And, and this is particularly important when you have a situation where not every patient's gonna have data in the VI, and, and so they, sometimes they look for data on a patient and there isn't any there, and so that makes it doubly important that it's really easy to do. So, and then, um, you know, as I, I think a little bit more of a supplemental capability, a single sign-on capability, so at least they only have to log in once if they have to look in another system. The next slide. Uh, patient consent. There's a technology role here, Mike talked about it, and that is to make it possible for organizations to collect patient consent within their own registration systems and have it automatically flow to vital, as opposed to having to, again, sign on to a separate system and enter the patient's consent status. And Christina will talk about, we've seen very significant improvements very rapidly as a result of having implemented an interface um, of the sort with the UVM Medical Center, and I think there's a lot more opportunity to do that. And so that's, I think, where the technology role comes in, the patient consent question, and of course there are other dimensions. And then finally, um, security, and you know, we look at that as, um, you know, that's paramount. Um, if, the, if the confidence and the security and privacy of the data isn't there, then you know, nothing else is gonna work. And, you know, I want to emphasize that I think Vital has built a really solid foundation and has a really has had a really solid track record of improvement in the area of security. 
but, but for any company in today's environment, um, security is a never-ending battle and requires constant diligence. Um, and so it, we intend to continue the robust program of uh, regular audit by industry consultants. Um, and, that, and we've been using Synergistec, who I think do an outstanding job. Um, we are um, working on um, really having open governance, partnering with DIVA and the Agency of Digital Services, um, and have started to set up regular monthly meetings, um, uh, focusing just on security and privacy and the issues there. Um, maintaining a very accountable and specific and actionable plan according to the National Institute of Standards, uh, uh, security standards. And then uh, finally, um, transitioning to what's called the cybersecurity framework, which is really the coming trend in how to manage a security framework, really covers the same kind of information that the current NIST standards do, but approaches it in a different and potentially more useful way. And so we're intending to implement a framework there. Mm -hmm. Can I just interrupt for a quick second? Sure. Can you go back to just, you've gone through many of these technology or strategic initiatives. If you guys could just slide 25. Sure. Just so I can get a sense of the priority or the weight that you're putting on each of these. Yes. Um, in some sense, could you give, a, give us a quick assessment of how much either financial or human resources you're devoting to each of these? Or in other words, what's the priority of these? Yeah, sure. Priority one to five, or is there some other priority there? Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it's you know, a, I'm trying to figure out where you're parking your resources to achieve which of these yeah. First and yeah, honestly, it's, it's, it's hard to pick among them. I mean, um, the, um, you know, this, like I said, I think data security and privacy, that's table stakes, right? I mean, it's like you have to have that. It, it has to be above reproach and it requires constant diligence. So, so you know, to me, that's just an absolute essential one and probably where I'd start to think. But, but beyond that, I, I really think it's two, three, and four, where I would say are the most, the most important parts, and that is, um, yeah, um, you know, if you're not matching the data to the patients um, correctly um, and optimally, you know, like I said, that's a fundamental value proposition that the that the VHI has to that the Health Information Exchange has to provide, and so you need to do that extremely well. As Mike talked about, patient consent is very limiting if if uh, we don't see improvement there. We have a lot more data than we can let clinicians look at. Um, due to the due to the patient consent issue, and so advancing there, and then like I talked about, data availability and ease of use. I really think that um, that's another one of those hurdles that that um, you can have great data on the patients, and they may have consented to people looking at it, and you may have matched up to it really well. But if it's too hard for people to use, they won't use it. And does um, your staffing time reflect those priorities? Uh, I would say yes, but but um, you know I think the the thing that I would emphasize is that that uh, it's a small staff, um, and so it's not like you. You know, we've got you know tens of people that we're moving around. Um, it's it's a small team, but um, I, I guess I would say it more like um, it's where we prioritize our efforts among the staff. So so they, they don't, they're not typically dedicated. There are some exceptions. We have a person who's dedicated purely to security, for example, but but um, they typically are um, you know project driven across these priorities. Thanks. Yeah. Right, what should we glean from the fact that we just told us that data quality is the least. Those. Yeah, I would say, yeah, you know, it's, it's uh, and, and I realize it's like any one of those that I said was lowest on the priority list, <laughs> you're probably going, why did you make that one the lowest priority? But, but, but uh, um, I would say the reason that I would say that, um, you know, I probably um, picked that one last was because um, the, the, where I think um, the data quality issue becomes most important um, is when you're trying to use the data to improve healthcare quality and improve the healthcare system. And I think that that's one thing that, you know, I'd like to make sure that, you know, the board doesn't lose sight of is that, that um, the point of care is a really um, critical value that, that VITAL provides for a clinician to be able to see data on their patients while they're caring for the patient. But a huge part of the opportunity here is to improve the efficiency and quality of the healthcare system. And that's looking at the data in aggregate. And so that's you know, sort of where the health data management infrastructure is oriented toward. And that's where the data quality issue becomes particularly acute because 
in order to do that kind of aggregate analysis, the data has to be structured well and has to be standardized. So for example, if I'm looking at diabetes patients and I want to see how many of them had their hemoglobin A1C checked in the last six months, if, I, if there's different terminology being used for that test and I don't happen to look for all the terms, I'm going to get inaccurate information. And, and um, so, it's, so I think it's, it's, that's why probably I would say you know, I, I picked that one last, even though, like I said, it's hard to pick among all of these. And, and you know, we, we put these out there as the high priority focus areas, all of them, including data quality. So. Before I give it, give it over to Christina, um, any other questions? But it, 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 the question was like a Sophie's Choice on this one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, I know, we have competing alternatives for how to spend our right. money. So I was trying, I was, under, I was wondering if that really was your priority order, one to five, okay. or if you had different no, things. Yeah. And, yeah. It, and it was a great question. And one of the things that I, that we tried to do in the work plan and in the budget uh, with the contract with the state is really put some meat on these things in terms of the deliverable, what's the cost of the deliverable, what's sort of the incentive in the, in the deliverable as well. And those are in those, you know, this and others are in uh, that package. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna screw that up. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. So I just, I want to be respectful of your time. I know we're probably a bit over. How are we doing? We don't want to rush, so keep going. Oh, okay, great. Thank you very much. So the benefit of going last is that um, my partners in crime have said most of what I would have said. So I'd like to just go through the um, Q3 activities, maybe just highlight some of the areas that are in alignment with what has been said so far. So in order to address the um, areas in the HTS report that were called out, um, we, through this uh, fiscal year 18 contract, um, really hunkered down and started addressing some of the concerns prior to working with the state on the next contract. Um, and this goes to, um, uh, Jessica, I think you asked the question about the outreach and education. And so we have been focusing on client outreach and education. It's really a re-education. Um, in streamlining our staff, um, we've talked about uh, moving away from a siloed organization where we have teams that work on specific things, really doing cross-training and really, again, streamlining the work that we do so that we can use those resources in the most appropriate manner, again, being good stewards of the, of the state's money and, and the other clients that fund us. So we have used our staff um, to go out and educate on when someone asks about an interface. We also talk to them about vital access. We also talk to them about collecting consent. We've gone out to those users who we know have been permission to use Vital Access, the provider portal, but they don't seem to be using it very often. And it could be they just haven't had a need to look on a specific patient yet, or perhaps it's that they've forgotten, or they don't know how to use it, or they may not have seen the benefit, and some improvements have occurred over time. So we have been doing that work, and we've been focusing on consent, re-educating to collect consent, why they need to collect consent in order to help improve the um, number of patients who have uh, agreed to opt in to have their patient uh, data shared. We've also, I think Mike mentioned, the electronic consent implementation. We've worked with UVMMC, or University of Vermont Medical Center, Northeastern Vermont, uh, medical center in order to, at the time that they collect consent, they mark that within their own EHR or patient registration system. The, um, the registration secretary or the clinician does not now need to sign into the VHI to mark that same consent. Once they mark it in their own system, we've worked with those organizations' vendors to trigger an automatic message 
to go right to the beehive and flip the consent within the beehive. So it's transparent to the uh, provider and it's, it's real time. So you'll see the improvement in our uh, consent based on that work. In order to improve the utilization, like I said before, again, going back out to re-educate users. Um, in fact, one of the recent encounters that we had with the counseling service of Addison County with um, a provider that had actually been permissioned in 2015 went re-educated, showed the improvements, and the provider said, why am I not using this system? So it was really great to hear that just doing these efforts, we've been seeing where people have seen the improvement and, and maybe now more than when it was new, understand the benefit in this world of exchanging clinical uh, electronic data. Um, we are still implementing vital access, again, the provider portal. Contractually, we are um, supposed to uh, onboard 14 locations. We're already up to 11. We will probably go over the 14 locations, but that's okay. We want more users of the system. Um, and we want to aggregate more data. That's the interface portion, making sure that we can collect that data from organizations to contribute and share that information on their patients. Uh, for fiscal year 18, we're contractually obligated to implement 85. We already have 63 locations live. We will most likely, actually most definitely, go over the 85. But again, we want to get collect as much uh, uh, patient data as we can. And then again, improving patient matching. That is uh, critical, critical to the success of any HIE. And so we have been working with our HIE vendor um, Frank talked about the technology portion, about you know, how we can look at other ways to improve matching. We are working with Medicity in order to come up with better ways to do matching in the system that we already have. And Medicity has been engaged. They created a tool. We are working on that tool. And that will also lead into our contract for fiscal year 19 in order to continue to improve our patient matching. We want to hold um, our HIE platform vendor accountable to helping us improve in this area. So through the electronic consent that I walked you through um, at University of Vermont Medical Center and Northeastern Vermont uh, Regional Hospital, as well as that outreach and education, um, we have improved from where uh, HTS reported around July uh, 2017, we're in the 19% to 20% consent rate. Um, through those efforts, we are now at 32.5% um, of the patients who have opted in to having their uh, patient data shared electronically. So once the patient has opted in and the uh, data is able to be shared, we of course want to increase the utilization of those providers to actually access that data. And there's uh, two ways that we've highlighted here. So the gray bar up at the top is that vital access provider portal where the provider actually logs on and he or she can uh, search for their patient and review a comprehensive uh, patient record. And through our re-education efforts, and sometimes it, it depends upon whether it's flu season or not, whether or not um, there seems to be uh, something going on in the community, it can fluctuate, but we've been seeing a trend upward. And I believe since um, July 2017, that's about a 42% increase uh, from when, where we started. So we know we're headed in the right direction. And I'll, I'll talk about other areas to um, continue to improve in a, in a future slide. And I then, a great correlation chart would be um, provider queries. This is a patient level, right? Um, yeah, you know, we used to report on provider queries, and, and we moved away um, in order to do patient queries. But I can make a note of that, and if that's something that you'd like well, to see. I think it would be helpful to see how many providers across the system are using the system, right? That's, that's the yeah. main utilization. I do have a small number of providers with many patients, and that would reflect 
Yeah, I, I think we might even report on that now. So um, I can I can definitely get that for you in order to show you that. Or the next time you box. Okay, for sure. All right. So then the blue line shows the um, the Veterans Affairs um, query and exchange capability. And I'll, I'll just talk about this for a little bit because this, again, will um, lead in nicely to a future slide. So the Veterans Affairs is using um, what, what we would call a network-to-network -network query. They have an EHR, um, but it's a lifetime record. It's um, located throughout the nation. So it's almost like its own EHR is a network hub. So we've set up a network-to-network -network query where um, if a veteran, a Vermont veteran, is seen anywhere, um, that the provider at that location can query the VHI, and if the patient has provided consent, we can share that patient record. Back to what Michael Costa and Emily have always talked about, which is having this ubiquitous um, access to have data follow the patient where that patient is seen. We want Vermont veterans to be able to have their providers collect data. So in this, this is if a patient is seen outside of Vermont at one of those veteran areas, um, this is the number of queries that have been done over time. Um, what's not on this slide, which we will be including in future, is the number of providers who are now querying the Veterans Administration's electronic health record, and it's over 300 um, in March 2018. So um, more coming on that. So this is just to give you an idea of um, the, the locations that are contributing data to the BHI. Um, again, uh, locations can also receive data from the BHI in the form of um, uh, laboratory results, radiology results, transcriptions, which are in your reference slides, which I won't go over, but they're there in case you need that information. This is just about contributing data so that you're able to see the work that needs to still continue in order to collect more data. Um, the important thing to know from this is the total potential locations is just any practice that, uh, that exists in Vermont and the surrounding areas as well as locations with a known um, EHR. We may not even be um, knowledgeable in working with the state who even has an EHR or not. So this kind of tells you what your universe is. And these are the live locations um, that are contributing data. It's 269, um, which may look like a, only a few, but that is um, hospitals, which have obviously many, many patients. And it's also, um, it's representative of the organizations that are a priority through the blueprint, through One Care Vermont and through the Vermont Department of Health, um, as well as other clients who have said, we want to contribute data. So it's all based on a priority. So um, we've talked about where we're heading and for the fiscal year 19 contract extension, I just wanted to give a bit more detail on certain areas. Um, so we still want to increase the um, consent. We've made that pretty clear throughout this presentation. Um, what you might not know is in that contract, and I think this is in that contract matrix that uh, Emily Richards was uh, talking about, uh, that we are being incentivized in order to try and hit a 35% rate um, of consent. Um, we're working with uh, two hospitals right now in order to uh, implement the electronic consent in their EHR, again, would trigger and send um, the uh, patient consent decision to the VHI electronically. Who and the reason, those two? I'm sorry? Who are those two? Uh, they are Northwestern Medical Center and uh, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. I believe it's both of those. Um, I would also um, like to move into the um, uh, Brattleboro Memorial Hospital area. We just haven't talked to them because they've been dealing with, they, they recently switched EHRs, so we 
we want to give them a breather for a little bit <laughs> while they've been doing that. Um, but that, I think, will accelerate some of that um, uh, improvement in consent rate. Uh, again, being cautious that we would probably plateau at some point um, because the same patients might be consented in and it, it will flatten out. But we still want to do our part. And we want to, um, again, implement uh, easier ways to access that data. Again, you can have great data, you can have a patient consent in, but if a provider doesn't find it useful in order to go and view that data, what have you built? Um, and we want happy providers. So this gets back to um, what um, Frank was talking about, which is there's the capability of being able to do a single sign-on, which is literally a blue button within the provider's EHR. We work with the vendor. When the provider wants to see more data, they hit that button, transparent behind the scenes. It brings them right to, um, to the VHI provider access. With um, vendors who have a bit more advanced capability, um, again, think of the Veterans Affair. They do that query type of um, process. Other EHRs were working with the University of Vermont Medical Center in order to have them query and actually retrieve, and then it pops right into their own EHR, again, transparent to the provider, and they can see the data right within their, v their EHR in a format that they're already comfortable with. So we're working with them on that. Um, and I believe in the fiscal year 19 contract, we are looking um, to do one of each, a single sign-on and, um, and a query. So in order to improve the quality of the data, um, this, this gets to that data quality question, which is to um, use what we've invested in the terminology services um, solution that we have and um, come up with a plan to actually embed that into our production system. We um, want to work with an organization that is submitting data, especially onto a downstream uh, reporting system or registry, and outline areas that we believe, analyze their data, and outline areas that we believe that we would be able to work with them to improve data there would probably be the opportunity for them to improve data right at the source. And we want to um, really kill two birds with one stone, have them uh, fix their own data where necessary, helps their own providers, and then be able to actually enrich some of their data so that it's useful downstream as well. And we want to do a baseline and then we want to report on the improvements and show that to uh, DIVA, the organization, and the downstream system. We also want to do patient matching in this area, um, and that is what I was talking about before, working with our vendor, um, uh, Medicity, as well as what Frank mentioned, which is working with our partners to identify a uh, patient matching solution, an enterprise solution for the state and have uh, everybody weigh into that. And what we're looking to do in the um, patient matching realm is on a baseline um, that uh, was released when HTS did their report actually do a 40% increase by the end of the uh, fiscal year contract extension period, which ends on December 31st, 2018. And then um, we want to partner with Agency of Digital Services. I think Frank um, talked about that in working through the security plan. And we uh, also need to make sure that we complete the VHI architectural assessment that we started working on with the state. It was put on hold, and we've been asked to um, pick that back up with them uh, starting in the next contract year. And that's it. And we provided reference slides that are um, just updates from the last time that we were here in, I think, February, um, in case you had any questions on this. Great. Questions or comments from the board? I just have a quick one. Sure. Uh, this is about the Medicity contract. So I understand that you said that this is up in the end of June, I think you said. Yes. Um, and that you're, you're fairly confident that you'll be able to 
retain the same contract you've had in the past, but then we learned that Medicity is now potentially being acquired. Yes. So that suggests to me that there could be some potential risk in the negotiation of that contract. And I'm just wondering, how do you all feel about the risk of that contract, given the recent acquisition plans and you know potential there for change leverage? So. So I can say that Medicity has not increased their um, contract. In fact, they have um, reduced their contract, specifically in the medication query services, by 60% over time. So we have a really good relationship with them. And we look at the, um, the amount of work that we do within their system and try and right scale it for what we pay. Um, we do have a meeting with them next week to learn more about this merger. I'm not really sure if they're going to have any answers, but um, it is a question that we're going to be talking about um, and trying to reduce the cost, if anything, which I'm sure is what Mike's going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I'm just wondering if they're yes. getting bigger, they may have more leverage, right? So I'm just wondering. Yeah, it, 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 you <laughs> hit on something that's going to be really interesting. There's some risk involved here in what this is going to look like in the future. It's going to be, these things usually come together in the, in the course of a month or two or three or four. We have an immediate contract coming up with them that we're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to sign, and then we're going to try to figure this out. We had them coming in next week to talk about the single architect structure. Well, that's still going to be a discussion, but you're absolutely right. There is some risk here as with any sort of merger. What will that entity look like? What will they perform? What sort of when you merge, what sort of products go and come in that merger? It's going to be interesting. I've lived through a merger. I know how these things kind of work. And it's uh, it's going to be interesting. But there, I don't want to minimize. So you're confident in the June contract, but maybe next year. That's that's, that's where that's where I'm that's where I'm focused on. Okay. Thank you. I just have a question on you know with the morale of your staff is because one of the things you brought up was the risk of your organization as well as what you were brought up in, you know, capacity. And, you know, I totally am always looking for cost savings, and it's one of the things I push, but um, you guys did cut benefit costs, and you cut retirement costs, and there's kind of uncertainty about the future. So I just wonder, if, you know, if you're sitting in that seat working in IT, and there are maybe other jobs out there, you know, how are you going to keep and retain these, and are there any kind of retention plans you have out there to try to keep them? Sure. That, that's a great question. And one of the things that we decided, uh, and I think it's important, when we were addressing this, we were upfront with staff. Everything that you see here, we've put on the share drive for staff. Everything that we've discussed, we have uh, we've discussed with staff ahead of time. One of the things with the benefit cuts that you look at is that the area that we, we didn't touch the match rate for the retirement, but there was an incentive in there, a 6% incentive of annual salary that we did reduce. I have never seen that before. Now, maybe you have in the healthcare industry, but I had never seen it before. It was a, it was a unique benefit that I had just never seen. I explained to staff, I, I'll leave it to Christina. She, she interacts with them every day. Um, I think they appreciated us being up front with the challenges. We also explained the three-year challenge to them as well. I, I will say, I think the reaction has been positive more than negative uh, on that. Now, am I, being, am I hoping that's the case? Yes, but at the same time, I really believe as I go around, and I go around a lot and talk to staff, mm -hmm. that they appreciate the fact that we're being open and transparent with them and we're not surprising them with anything else. Um, and we've been that with every staff meeting that we've had. It's been open and transparent. And I'll ask Christina. She works with them every day. Yeah, I, I'd echo that. I, you know, we were. We were a little fearful in the beginning, you know, when everything was occurring in January, you know, how would staff react and, oh my gosh, would we have a mass ex exodus? And it's, it's really been surprising. We've been seeing the, the teams, like we talked about, really starting to um, break, break down those silos, even by themselves, really jump into the cross-training, 
they feel that they're providing more value uh, among their colleagues. We do have some clinicians on staff, which I feel um, are really now coming into their glory because they're able to really help work on the data quality. They're excited to uh, understand that we are getting back down to basics and we are working on these core areas. Um, I think that they understand that and they know what they're marching toward. They hear about the HIE steering committee. They're excited to know that everybody's working on really communicating and really trying to define that, um, that answer to Mike's question, which is what is success and do we all know what we're marching toward? Another thing that I'd like to add is that we're looking on at incentivizing the staff in ways that um, aren't, don't really require any investment. Um, you know, we, we had a pizza parter and a party and a potluck and, and people brought um, in food and we celebrate, we celebrate the wins and sometimes that those are some of the simple things that they just need to see to feel valued and feel that they're actually adding to something that they're extremely passionate about, which is making sure that patients get the care that they need and that the outcomes are favorable for providers. Thanks. Other questions or comments from the board? If not, we'll open it up to the public for any questions or comments. Ken. Uh, yes, I, I have a comment to make one quick question. Uh, one comment is I heard uh, Mike Smith make a disparaging comment uh, about himself. And I just wanted to reaffirm that he made many more mistakes in his leadership role, uh, not just that minor one that he alluded to. Uh, having said that, I, I want to go on the record of saying he was also outstanding in performing in his roles in state leadership. Having said that, you know, when you do a good job, then more, a lot more is expected, and a lot more is expected now. And uh, there's just one issue that uh, I just wanted to raise, and maybe it's a question. About 35 years ago, I first walked into a health and welfare committee meeting, and um, one of the topic was lamenting about the lack of standardization in reporting of health care. And this over, you know, three decades or four decades has been the bane for a practitioner community, but for the whole healthcare community. And I would say, you know, it's one of those issues that uh, tests vitals ability to do something because after 40 years, it's sort of still on the agenda with this token, we're gonna try to standardize more forms or whatever. And what we still have is a mess. So the question is, is there any particular strategy, um, you know, other than calling on Superman, because it's been 40 years of trying to simplify, to standardize, <laughs> and to streamline reporting so that we could all benefit from it. When I think of standards, so yeah, you're talking about standards in reporting, and, and some of that comes down to just standards in connecting and trying to get the data. And so uh, we have, Emily uh, Richards mentioned that we're working on connectivity criteria. Um, I think it was you, Emily, sorry. If it was Michael, I apologize. Um, so Vital has been working with Diva to come up with um, connectivity criteria that's enhanced that the Green Mountain Care Board um, will eventually review that, that new connectivity criteria that will be part of the HIE plan. And part of that is to really establish standards for the state of Vermont um, based on standards that exist out there. And there are many, many standards and it is the bane of my existence. And the best way that I believe that, that um, Vermont can be positioned is to uh, stay abreast of all of the standards that are out there and be positioned to be able to accept data in whatever standard that is. I'll give you one example of where this could have been an issue. So uh, the University of Vermont Medical Center wants to do that query um, uh, directed exchange with, with the Beehive. And we were going to do an, an um, a direct connection 
directly to their EHR EPIC. They have since decided to do that network to network query using the ONC standard, which is called the eHealth Exchange. It is the same network query that's done by the Veterans Administration that I talked about through their EHR. Since we're already on that platform, we already meet those standards, we could say to the University of Vermont, that's just fine if you want to connect that way. We're already set up to do that, and we can continue on. So hopefully we can do that connection regardless of what standard somebody wants to connect by. Does that help answer your question? Sort of? OK. Yes. Um, Kathy Colton, Executive Director of the Vermont Program for Quality yeah. and Healthcare. Uh -huh. <laughs> On slide eight, and I think this kind of dovetails with Ken's comments, um, I definitely see an mm -hmm. opportunity from my organization's perspective um, where you um, we have identified you know, the importance of some expected outcomes and include um, improves patient safety and avoids medication errors. Mm -hmm. But that is of particular interest because our organization <coughs> currently is the subcontractor for the statewide patient safety and surveillance and reporting system. And if there's any way that data can flow in an unhindered, free way that can help unburden hospital personnel mm -hmm. and make all of the systems safer for patients, um, we are happy helpers in that project and we look forward to it, an opportunity to continue this conversation. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, other questions, comments from the public? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we'll invite uh, Sarah and Agatha to come down. Um, the, the requirement, the responsibility to review VITALS budget and core activities came to the board in 2015. So this will be our third review of VITALS budget. Um, as Kevin mentioned earlier, H901, which is kind of in process in the legislature, removes the responsibility to review core activities. So Agatha and I, um, uh, you know, as you saw, we reviewed VITALS budget, but not core activities today. Um, that's something that we've um, elected to put on hold until H901 is resolved. Um, so today we're just going to walk you through the criteria um, that the board has in the past used to review VITALS budget um, and make a staff recommendation. So the criteria was adopted, um, has been adopted, and it's a little different this year because there's kind of three moving parts. Um, there's the HTS report, the transition at VITAL, and then the pending legislation. So we recommend using that same criteria, but looking at that criteria, criteria through the lens of those three moving parts. Um, and specifically, when you're looking at the criteria, and this is what Sarah and I did as we reviewed the budget, is to focus on transparency, um, the alignment with the HTS go HIE goals, as, as described in the HTS report, and um, stakeholder recommendations. So this slide lists one through four, but we're gonna go through each one of these um, slide by slide. So the first, and I wanted to mention that there was a question during public comment about the board's role in the vital budget process. And I think that the four criteria that we're about to go through kind of shed some light on what the role of the board is. So like the first um, criteria is transparency. And Sarah and I, as we, we've been working on this, um, we really keep coming back to that one of the 
uh, role, the, one of the goals of the board's role is a transparency la layer, that it brings all of this into the public eye. Um, so in reviewing the first budget criteria, the review process will be transparent and will incorporate public input. And in order to do that, trans the transparency will be measured by um, compliance with the budget guidance that we sent to VITAL. Um, an overall transparency of the budget process. Also, it will include a 10-day public comment period. Um, and so in our assessment, VITAL has complied with the budget guidance. They've been um, very timely and organized, very accessible, um, collaborative, and so we feel that they've complied with the budget guidance. Um, additionally, the public so comment. that 10-day, I'm just questioning the date there, since, to, since today is the ninth, 10, 10 business days approximately, okay. so two, two Wednesdays from now, okay. correct? And, and it's a recommendation, we can adjust that. We can adjust that date. I think we had originally um, presented to the board a schedule that included a little bit less time for public comment, but since the meeting on the 23rd was canceled, um, we took that opportunity to extend that public comment period a little bit if the board is amenable. Historically, how many comments have we received on that budget? Do you know? I do not know. Susan, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, off the top of my head, don't recall having a lot of comments, but we can look back and I don't recall it being heavily commented. Obviously, well, I would say if we vote on the 23rd, that's more than ample. Yeah, and obviously, um, staff will review all of those comments and compile them and, and can present them to the board um, again prior to any vote. So based on our review of um, VITAL's budget, budget and completion of the public comment period, um, we would consider this criteria has been met, this first criteria. So any questions about that first criteria? Okay. So the second criteria is really about um, the uh, kind of alignment with our um, state goals for the HIE program um, and for our healthcare system in general, as well as the staff recommendation piece, or uh, excuse me, um, stakeholder recommendation piece that Agatha mentioned earlier. Um, so here we have some language that we had shared with the board um, a few weeks ago in terms of our recommendation for how to consider that, um, consider that met. And what we're saying is that in the absence of a current um, HIT or HIE plan, um, we see the HTS document and those recommendations as kind of the critical pieces that, that we wanted to ensure alignment with. Um, and Diva and providing, um, Diva and Vital in providing back the contract to us um, also included a, a, an actual matrix lining up how the deliverables of that contract um, meet the recommendations in the HTS report. So that's something that the board's been provided with. Um, and in addition, um, we know that DIVA and the HIE Steering Committee are working to develop an HIE plan, which is due to the board in October, I believe, um, to support future budget reviews. Um, so that's something that we can kind of come back to as we move forward. Um, so based on these things, um, I think Agatha and I would recommend um, to the board to kind of deem that met. Any questions about that criteria? Um, Third, and this is really more of a process point, um, the board's uh, review must be structured and timed um, so as not to impede DIVA and VITAL's contract negotiations. And one of the things that we did um, kind of working with DIVA and VITAL this year was we, we moved our review process a little bit later in the season. So largely, um, the board's reviewed VITAL's budgets in March um, before the end of the contracting period. So DIVA and VITAL are still negotiating. We review the budget and then it changes and we need to do a re-review. This year, um, by delaying it until May, um, we've allowed them to have a completed contract that's already um, with um, their federal partners for reviews so and we know we're kind of looking at a final budget. So um, based on this, we would recommend that that criteria is also met. And then the last criteria is that the process must result in board decisions that are sufficiently clear to enable VITAL to do its work and DIVA to support that work without requiring repeated clarification or intervention by the board. So in order for the board to make clear decisions, sufficiently clear decisions, they need sufficiently clear data um, and material. And we've structured the budget process to get that information to you ahead of time in um, a fashion that meets those needs that you can make clear decisions. 
Um, and so the board will ensure that written decisions stemming from this budget review are sufficiently clear based on that um, and our review and the budget presentation today, we consider this criteria has also been met. So um, in conclusion, um, Agatha and I would recommend um, that the board, uh, pending public comment, of course, approve vitals um, FY 2019 budget as presented. Um, because the second half of the budget is um, kind of waiting on a, a contract that's not yet finalized, uh, we would recommend approving the budget um, with the caveat that um, DBA and VITAL return in probably November or December, um, about six months from now, and that um, you know the, the calendar year 2019 contract um, is finalized so that we can receive an update on the budget, um, see whether there are any major discrepancies from the budget that was presented today, and kind of assess um, whether that um, makes any changes in the board's opinion. Any questions? Okay, questions from the board? Okay, if not, questions or comments from the public? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just, uh, it appears that we will likely be voting on this on May 30th. Mm -hmm. The potential vote is scheduled for May 30th. Yes. So with that, um, is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Good moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of this beautiful day.